Despite the staggering defeat in New York, the Tammany secured one big victory next year with the election of Martin Van Buren to president. In the beginning of Van Buren's presidency, the Tammany's had a practical problem with the bankers in the leadership. The financial mismanagement of Eastern banks had set the stage for the Panic of 1837 and the subsequent depression that followed. Some kind of financial reform was needed. The notion that they were to blame for the hardships America was now facing made the leadership indignant. But the Locofoco and Equality factions had the votes and expunged the leadership, with Van Buren integrating Locofoco economic ideas into his policy. The economic downturn felt in New York affected the Whigs, and with Tammany reoriented to their pro-working class roots, the Whigs were forced to expend all their tricks to keep Tammany only just out of the majority. The Whigs were sloppy, and evidence of aforementioned rigging practices were plain to see. Tammany's fraud was more subtle, and thus they were able to fly under the public's notice. The Whigs turned on a dime, though, calling for voter registration in the state legislature in a bill that would also make voter fraud a felony. The Tammany struggled against the bill, the Common Council decried it as prohibitive and unconstitutional. Despite this, it passed, and penalties were increased in 1841. Many of the most powerful Tammany sachems would soon find themselves on the run. Samuel Swartwout, high-ranking Tammany and port official, had fled with jewels stolen from the Prince of Orange. In the ensuing investigation, it was uncovered that Swartwout had stolen an estimated $1.2 million from the government via manipulation of customs house receipts. With Swartwout gone, many of the other sachems left politics to let the heat die down, leaving a power vacuum in Tammany Hall. The vacuum was filled increasingly by immigrants and their people, most notably street gangs, which became integrated into the Tammany Armory and soon came to dominate. The Irish Famine of 1850 caused a tsunami of desperate Irish into New York City, and they were put to good use by the new Tammany's. Tammany Hall, now more or less the Guild of Thieves it was always meant to be, began streamlining the naturalization process for their many foreign associates, in addition to furnishing them with hard-to-come-by and relatively well-paying jobs. Though Tammany's influence in the city was waxing, their weakening impact outside of the Hudson Valley reflected the characteristic rural-urban divide that still exists in New York today. Though the Tammany's were able to secure a plurality for Van Buren's re-election in the city, Harrison carried New York State, winning over the rural folks with his plain clothes, humble upbringing, and reputation as a war hero. Though Old Tippy Canoe, 68 at the time of his inauguration, within a month, died of pneumonia, and his successor, John Tyler, was a squib, whose attempted investigations into the machine behind Van Buren only roused the ire of Congress, and Tammany was free to continue their activities unseen. The Tammany's buoyed their voter turnout by offering the inmates of Blackwell's Island, known today as Roosevelt Island, freedom in exchange for votes, the gangs moved herds of criminals from polling place to polling place. Factionalism once more racked Tammany Hall under the leadership of Fernando Wood, who previously fled politics to avoid the corruption scandal in the wake of Swartwout's legendary heist. This factionalism was underlined by high levels of inter-gang violence as the individual gangs vied for supremacy in the hall. The Tammany gangs were also confronted by a growing undercurrent of nativist gangs, such as the Bowery Boys, who dogged the steps of any Irish ne'er-do-wells in Manhattan. These factions were roughly equally divided into the Barn Burners, anti-slavery radicals that sought abolition by force, and the Hunkers, who, as the name suggests, sought to hunker down and not ruffle any of the feathers of the pro-slavery textile mill owners. The factions came together to induct James K. Polk symbolically into Tammany Hall, after their guests left, fighting resumed 
to the detriment of their electability. The Tammanys had long since expanded their machine to the police. The many ineffectual municipal police forces were under the threat of being usurped by the newly established citywide Metropolitan Police Force, organized by Democrat Mayor William Frederick Havemeyer, no longer in Tammany's pocket. Hostilities between the municipals and the Metropolitans escalated to violence and a riot when a few Metropolitans attempted to arrest Fernando Wood for his open corruption. Wood called upon his municipal allies who fought hard, but ultimately failed to prevent Wood's arrest. Unrest against the Metropolitan Police Force was continued by the Tammany-affiliated gangs, culminating in the two-day Dead Rabbits riot, in which a gang war between most of the Irish and American gangs escalated when the Metropolitan Police got involved, resulting in upwards of a hundred injuries and eight confirmed deaths. Fernando Wood attempted to solidify himself as the de facto head of Tammany, but was quickly drummed out for running explicitly against the Tammany's traditional rules of leadership. Wood left to form the Mozart Hall, basically Tammany for Germans, and was replaced by William M. Tweed. Wood continued to attempt to regain his position in Tammany, by aligning himself on the eve of the Civil War with the peace faction of the Democrats. Tweed and most of Tammany followed in their predecessors' footsteps by falling in with the war faction, as war is good for business. Interestingly, Tammany Hall was at the same time pro-war and pro-slavery, both because the wealthy of New York were heavily invested in textile mills, which ran on cheap slavery-produced southern cotton. Once the war commenced, Tammany Hall was on its best behavior, only briefly drawing attention by entertaining the idea of New York becoming a free and independent city modeled on Hamburg in Germany. Under the watchful eye of Boss Tweed, Tammany achieved heretofore unimagined levels of corruption. Systems were put in place to expertly funnel dirty money through legitimate Tammany businesses, which were vertically integrated into the Tammany Hall superstructure. Tweed presided over the city's expansion northward into what we consider the Upper East Side and Upper West Sides of Manhattan, as well as the monumental Brooklyn Bridge project. All that pales in comparison to what I consider one of the greatest cons in the history of the United States, the old New York courthouse at 52 Chambers Street. The Italianate building in Lower Manhattan Civic Center started construction in 1861 under the architect John Kellum and took over a decade to finish. The brazen acts of corruption drew heavy fire from the press and would ultimately be Boss Tweed's undoing. The courthouse cost New York State $11 million, the majority of which went into the pockets of Tweed and Tammany Hall, because Tweed would give contracts for every item that entered the construction site to Tammany patrons, who would sell everything from supplies to furniture at a wildly inflated price, skimming a customary percentage off the top for Tweed and selling their wares for non-competitive prices. Comparatively, the territory of Australia was... What are you talking about? The territory of Alaska was purchased for a total of seven and a quarter million dollars. Adjusted for inflation, the cost of the courthouse would be $250 million in 2024. The lid came off the project in 1871 when County Auditor and Tammany Finance Chief James Watson was killed by a horse, the 2024 equivalent to getting hit by a car, and his audit books fell into the hands of former Sheriff James O'Brien. O'Brien sought to extort Tweed and got his chance in the wake of an Irish Protestant riot that was quelled harshly by Tammany Irish Catholic police. 
the majority Protestant populace of New York sided with the Ulstermen, and Tammany's popularity suffered. O'Brien took the opportunity to blackmail Tweed and the rest of Tammany. When Tammany Hall refused, the books were sent to the New York Times. The resulting articles had relatively little impact among the people. It wasn't until the father of the American political cartoon, Thomas Nast, cartoonist for Harper's Weekly, ruthlessly satirized the corpulent Tweed that the populace began to turn on him. The satire, in combination with his arrogant attitude toward the investigation, torpedoed his popularity. Tweed himself famously credited Nast with his ultimate downfall, supposedly saying, Stop them damn pictures. I don't care so much what the papers say about me. My constituents don't know how to read, but they can't help seeing them damn pictures. And though this may just be a truism, it fits nonetheless. Tweed was arrested on October 26th, paying his million-dollar bail, he still won his state senate re-election before being re-arrested. Tweed was in and out of jail until finally being re-arrested on a $3 million bail in 1875. On December 3rd, Tweed escaped the Ludlow Street Jail to New Jersey, laying low for a few days before making his way to Brooklyn, where he then boarded a ship to Cuba. Narrowly avoiding the Cuban authorities, Tweed escaped again to Spain, where he was finally captured and returned to New York. Tweed died in Ludlow Street Jail in 1878. Over his career, it's estimated that Tweed stole upwards of $200 million from New York State alone, roughly $6 billion in today's money. It didn't take long for Tammany to rebound. This wasn't their first rodeo, after all. In 1871, Tammany Hall elected former Sheriff Honest John Kelly to the position of boss. While Kelly's nickname was ironic, he was at least not directly connectable to Tweed and had further connections to the Catholic Church that aided him in rehabilitating Tammany Hall's wider reputation. By 1874, Tammany had recuperated enough political influence to regain the mayor seat and things were more or less smooth sailing until 1886. By the mid-1880s, growing union and labor movements contrasted once more with the matured Irish-American demographics Tammany relied on. No longer being the destitute, tired, and huddled masses they were a generation ago, the Irish had become firmly middle class. The machine had once more been unable to usurp a populist labor movement, and inadvertently encouraged the union-founded United Labor Party's candidate, the political economist and journalist Henry George, to run for office to spite them. Though the ULP was popular, the Democratic Party was ascendant in New York, and even the split vote couldn't prevent the Tammany candidate from winning the mayoral race, even despite running against Theodore Roosevelt. The Tammanys also came close to the edge in the early 1890s when a state political corruption probe exposed leadership's bribery and money laundering activities, but Tammany leadership escaped unindicted. Tammany Hall got off light. The ULP could not affect the change they desired politically, and after the death of the ULP's prime candidate, Henry George, to a stroke days before the 1897 mayoral election, they disintegrated back into the Central Labor Union, and Tammany managed to repair the rift between the Hall and Labor. Teddy Roosevelt, on the other hand, had won the governorship in 1898 by a slim 1% majority, and in spite of, or more specifically as a testament to, the absolute state New York was in, Teddy accomplished his goals in only one year. Teddy's one-year governorship came in like a hurricane. Among other things, but specifically pertaining to Tammany Hall, Roosevelt instigated the Maslet investigation, which put Tammany leadership to flight. Though the machine had systems in place for such eventualities, and the organization as a whole continued to prosper 
once the bull moose trotted off to bigger issues. At the turn of the century, politics in New York City began consolidating and decentralizing into borough politics. By the end of the Second World War, citywide political machines of all stripes simply became irrelevant. Tammany maintained its firm grip on Manhattan, but like the rest of the old political machines, the wave of reformers seeking the honor of slaying these beasts made city politics more dangerous. Tammany relied on the long bonds of loyalty via patronage to maintain its voter base, something cultivated over long decades and not easily broken in the days when family honor and a person's word meant something. The Tammanys were guided through the first quarter of the new century by the longest-serving boss, Charles Silent Charlie Murphy. Murphy was in stark contrast to the previous boss as he was teetotal and personable. Murphy was never officially the leader of Tammany Hall. You know how these things go. But nevertheless steered Tammany on the right path politically, advising his candidates on what we are familiar with today as optics. Murphy basically making sure that they keep out of any trouble that would tarnish their and Tammany's reputation, a lesson Boss Tweed would have benefited from and whose fall no doubt informed Murphy's ideas. Tammany politicians championed progressive reform and reaped the benefits. Murphy also invested heavily in inculcating new Italian immigrants into Tammany as the flow of Irish immigrants slowed. In turn, Tammany would replace the waning Irish street toughs with an altogether new organization, the Mafia. Tammany found itself bound up with the newspaper magnate William Randolph Hearst and his political ambitions. Hearst, a Californian, sought to be president. He calculated the best way to do this was to start by running for Congress in New York, a task he enlisted Tammany Hall to achieve in 1902. Hearst turned on Tammany when seeking the mayor seat, a race he lost before refocusing on becoming governor with Tammany's blessing. Hearst's gubernatorial ambitions failed after a grueling campaign that nearly split Tammany leadership and Hearst parted ways with the Hall and the Democratic Party. Hearst left politics after being defeated as a Republican against his self-proclaimed rival, Franklin Roosevelt, and slunk back to California, content to pull strings on occasion with his papers. Tammany's influence began to wane under their next boss, George W. Olvaney. Olvaney, a lawyer and later judge, sought primarily to enrich himself to the detriment of the Hall's wider political stance. Gone were the days when Tammany Hall was able to get the president to look the other way, and Olivani fled the political field when Franklin Roosevelt sicked the former appellate judge Samuel Seabury on Tammany to investigate alleged frauds in city politics, with a particular eye towards Olvaney. Tammany was now a pariah, and it was open season for the Tammany Tiger. Tammany received a mortal wound with the hybrid ticket election of 1933. Tammany Mayor Jimmy Walker was ousted by Roosevelt when Seabury uncovered Walker accepted bribes from businessmen seeking municipal contracts. Roosevelt, a staunch reformer, had Tammany affiliates systematically stripped of their federal positions, and threw his weight behind Republican firebrand Fiorello LaGuardia for the mayor seat. LaGuardia, in his term as mayor, sought nothing less than the complete reorganization of New York City. The alderman turned on Tammany, electing a LaGuardia ally to head the Common Council, sending shockwaves through Tammany Hall. Upon the decision, Silent Charlie's protege and Bronx Tammany boss Augustus Pierce died of a heart attack on the spot in City Hall. LaGuardia championed a new city charter, disestablishing the Dutch-based ward and common council systems 
for the unicameral proportional representation New York City Council that remains to this day. LaGuardia also expanded the civil service requirement to most city jobs. LaGuardia was massively popular and won re-election in his own right as America exited the Great Depression during the Second World War. The Tammany's last bastions of power, the Works Progress Administration and the Civilian Conservation Corps came to an end, and so too did their ability to get Tammany Associates jobs. Tammany's association with organized crime was also abruptly severed in this era, as Tammany could no longer provide jobs and the mafia was whittled down, Tammany was cut off from its source of power and thus withered. In 1943, Tammany Hall sold their headquarters at 44 Union Square and couldn't afford to acquire a new building. Tammany looked to be rebuilding itself in the post-war boom years, but advances in the justice system and Tammany's reputation, as well as its new Italian leadership's more conspicuous association to the Mafia, marked Tammany Hall for death. Carmine de Sapio, the last Tammany boss, struggled against the insurmountable tide of anti-Tammany sentiment. Republicans wanted to score the final blow, and Democrats wanted to bury their association with Tammany Hall. New Democratic clubs denied anyone with Tammany Association entry. Eleanor Roosevelt organized a Democratic coup de grace with the New York Committee for Democratic Voters, dedicated to snuffing out the Tammanys. Though this seemed personal for Eleanor because Carmine hadn't supported her son Franklin Delano Roosevelt Jr.'s political ambitions. DeSapio was ousted in 1961, the previous election saw Tammany's become unelectable, with Tammany Hall as an old corrupt parasite. The credit for the final blow goes to Ed Koch. First with his 1963 defeat of DeSapio in Greenwich Village for the city council seat, and finally when Koch's village independent Democrats defeated DeSapio's Manhattan Party to become the congressman for New York's 17th Congressional District. Started by a Revolutionary War veteran and a pollsterer to oppose the Society of the Cincinnati's growing desire to establish a neo-nobility in America, nativist, Protestant, and dressed like Indians, little by little Tammany Hall became the biggest corruption racket in the city, as well as champion of the immigrant, Catholic, all while in plain clothes. They had presidents begging to join. Bribes went unquestioned. The police sat at heel on a leash on one side, and gangs sat at heel on the other. After 179 years, 5 months, and 23 days, billions stolen, and unquantifiable damage done to New York, the roaring Tammany Tiger died, curled up in Greenwich Village.